right, the 21 Convention, Tampa, Florida. Here we are, and we have a speaker who has not only been featured at the 21, uh, the previous 21 Convention, so 21 Convention alumni speaker, but he's also been on the 21 Convention podcast, and he is guest hosting on the 21 Convention podcast as well. He has a master's degree in exercise science. He's a partner and trainer at Efficient Exercise. And this man is gonna talk about something which has affected my life in a very big way. That is fatherhood. Skylar Tanner, let's take it away. Thank you, Steve. What's up, man? How you doing, man? All right. All right, all right, all right, all right. Fatherhood, first 12 months. Should really be fatherhood the first 21 months um, and I'll get into that in a second, but before I do, I want to give you guys a little tip, a scientifically vetted tip for improving your relative ratio of success and picking up women by 100%. Here's the fun thing about statistics, the absolute ratio, 10%. Nonetheless, there's a book called Subliminal, written by Leonard Lonnow, who is, an, who is a uh, rocket scientist, worked with Stephen Hawkins, and he writes really good pop science books. And the French, of course the French, have done research on the best way to pick up women. In Western France, what they did, they had this beautiful square, and they were approaching women with a relatively simple line, throwing it in, which was, hello, my name is Raul. I think you're very beautiful. I'd like to take you out to dinner. Could I have your phone number and call you later? And if they said yes, the guys would go, oh, it's okay, it's just for science. Look right over there. There's, there's you know. And if they said no, they'd go, it's not my lucky day. They doubled their, chance, they doubled their success rate by when they said, Hello, my name is Raul. I think you're very beautiful. They reached out and tapped them on the forearm. Not creepy grab like you're not going anywhere, because that'll, that'll, that'll double your failure rate to below zero. But they, it was just a light touch. That moved up to 20% success rate. Very interesting. It's because we have these cutaneous receptors in our skin that link just to the emotive centers of our brain and nowhere else. It totally bypasses that whole rational component. And you'll notice the best schmoozers around, the people who are most relational, they're, ta they're tap. They tap, they touch, they tap, they touch. That's why. So I'm married. I don't know how I got my trick my wife into hanging out with me to begin with. So I can't offer you any actual concrete advice, but I can tell you science has determined light touch is a good idea. But on to the fatherhood component. So, I have a basic agenda here, which is I'm going to give you a little bit of background about the pregnancy, because there's always the pre-pregnancy. And then there's the actual first nine months, the birth, and kind of the first year. And I wanted to talk about this because it's all the things I wish I knew before pregnancy said in a way that I would like to hear them. And what I mean by that is there are mommy blogs. If you Google mommy blog, you get 650-odd thousand hits. If you Google daddy blog, you get like 125,000 hits. And on top of that, uh, women will write a whole lot more about their mommying experience. Guys are sort of like, I changed a lot of diapers. And that's kind of the, the long and short of it. So, <laughs> so it has to be said in a way that you're going to hear it. And so it's like if you're at a bar or you're at a coffee shop with friends and you're just shooting the shit, right? There's cussing, there's jokes, there is a certain um, guyness about the information. You tend to re remember it a lot more. It's uh, like uh, myself. Bill D. Simone, who's going to speak tomorrow, Eric, uh, Dr. Eric Daniels, who you'll see speak in the James yesterday, we're all at the bar. And I can remember almost everything we said and we talked about because of the environment it was in. So I'm trying to create, recreate some of that with this talk. Um, but the, the disclaimer is I'm not a doctor, nurse, or any medical professional. I mean, I have a degree in exercise science and I train people for a living. But, uh, and I'm all also judging or implying that what I've learned and found useful is the one right way. Uh, you're going to see this a lot in parenting books, this, uh, this notion of attempting to appeal to this notion of ah, beauty, golden, shiny, one right way. It doesn't exist. And in fact, the literature on parenting in general indicates that uh, if you care enough about some of this mundane crap, that's the right thing to do. It's not about the baby Einstein books. It's the fact that you're a parent who would pull their hair out over trying to find something like baby Einstein, that you care so much. So. First of all, you have to make the decision at some point unless you, know, you, you thought the rhythm method and pulling out was going to be sufficient birth control. Um, there is no perfect time, first of all. My wife and I decided to have a kid. I was thinking about possibly getting a PhD. Fortunately, thought better of it. Um, 
But I, I pull my hair out like, oh, I don't want to have a kid during this process. And she sort of said, well, if you don't have a kid during the PhD, if we wait until you, you know, you start, before you start the PhD, then you'll have the second kid during the PhD. There's just, you're going to have kids at some point. And I had it in my, idea, my mind that kind of the segmented, like, you have your learning period of your life, and then you have your parenting period of your life. And, and it, no, 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 no. You're probably going to, you're always going to be learning, or you're dying. I mean, you, that's the idea. So there's no perfect time. You're not going to find, okay, the market, the stock market's right, and the moon is aligned, and uh, I still have a full head of hair. Now's the perfect time. It's not, it just doesn't exist. The, the whole notion of perfection and as far as timing exi doesn't exist. But when we first got pregnant, we actually ended up having a miscarriage. Now, this is actually much more common than is talked about. Uh, with most of my clients tend to be women. I talked to a large, I talked to them about it, and a large portion of them had also had miscarriages, one or even two. It just didn't get talked about a lot. So my dad's 60th birthday, I live in Austin, we're driving out to West Texas. And we're going to Marfa. Does anyone know what Marfa is? Anybody? We got one guy. Marfa is, here's my description. If you, anybody from New York City? Anybody? Okay. If you were born in New York City and you never left Manhattan, Marfa is what you would think a West Texas town would be. Of course it's not going to have a, a lot of people, but it'll have art galleries and good coffee shops and, and all these cultural happenings and concerts and things that don't actually happen in small towns because they don't have a critical mass of culture. Marfa is so put on, but it's kind of, it's kind of endearing that way. So let's take my dad to Marfa. All right, we'll go to Marfa. We're driving out. Five hours later, my wife calls me in tears. We've lost the baby. Flip that car around, drive back five, five hours. Um, the next morning, she had a DNC, which is the medical, I forget the full medical name, for the procedure to remove the remains of the baby. Now, we were... 12-ish weeks along. So this might be the, this is perhaps the curse of modern medicine and modern imaging is you know too soon. Uh, some of my clients, they said, we didn't have this luxury. And so we thought maybe we just missed a period or two and just had a heavy period. And when really they probably had a natural miscarriage. Um, we had a little ceremony kind of thinking about and, and celebrating our, our loss, which seems kind of funny celebrating the loss, but you learn from it and you feel from it. And you never forget it. But I had, we had to go through that in order to get my son. And so we were fortunate enough to get pregnant a short time later and uh, a couple months afterwards. And it wasn't even the perfect time based on our original decision, but it's, it's worked out beautifully. So kind of a background, and we move into the first nine months. Inevitably, you end up with these high def photos of like soft focus, <laughs> this is pregnancy, you know, kind of stuff. Uh, little hands, little, little this, little that. This is what the life starts off as. You're going to have the monthly photo. Here's one month, here's two months, here's three months documenting, especially now in an Instagram world. And you've got to be supportive of this because here's the thing. If you decide to keep the baby, if your wife decides to keep the baby, motherhood begins at conception. It sounds like a right-wing talking point, like life begins at conception. Motherhood begins at conception. Fatherhood does not begin until that baby is born. So you are merely playing backup support during the first nine months. And what I wish I would have known then is the baby might not be here, but if that pregnancy happens during Mother's Day, you damn well better get her a Mother's Day card. Do, learn from my mistake, because you will never hear the end of it, and as well, you shouldn't hear the end of it. She's a mother. She's nursing that kid. Her back's hurting. She's got all this relaxin floating around in her blood in which uh, relaxin is a, little, a beautiful little hormone that gets the tendons and ligaments to loosen up so the pelvis can change shape for, for birth. Um, so. Even though my wife worked out up until about a week before our kid was born, um, you know, there's still the, you're, you're still suffering a, a physical toll on a daily, daily basis. Uh, and then you have to get these types of photos, right? So here's a fun little, little fact about this. That's my wife, Sarah. Uh, we're about uh, six or seven months pregnant at that point. We're outside, and we live in Austin. And a, these are genuine smiles, because normally you kind of put on the smile when you're taking these soft focus photos and the hair is all up and wonderful for these uh, pre-pregnancy photos. There's a couple across the street having the nastiest fight ever. Like we're sitting out in the front yard and they're yelling, they're slamming doors, they're doing burnouts, they're screaming. It's like, um, it's, uh, 
it's very, very interesting in our neighborhood too. And then about the same time, two of our favorite characters, we live in a gentrifying area of Austin. And so there's a woman who always rides by on her power scooter. She can walk, but she rides around the neighborhood smoking a joint and uh, on her power scooter. So she rolls by like a comedy of errors. And there's one more guy who, he's probably in his mid forties. We call him Flavor Flav because he, he dresses with the big sparkly hat and the long chains, he's totally benign. Like, like if, you were, if you were lily white, fresh, fresh from the suburb, and you showed up in my neighborhood, you'd be a little worried. But this guy, he, he'll like pull your trash can up for you. But otherwise, you're sort of like, hey, you know, what's up, Flav? Um, and so he could very well be Flavor Flav. Like, the guy's on hard times. I know he's lost some of his money. And so, uh, so Flavor, Flavor walks by, too. So it's a comedy of errors. So you get these, these actual big, giant smiles. And, and again, you're playing support, right? You're, you're being supportive. You don't really want to take the photos. But in hindsight, you kind of want that documentation because you've heard the term, uh, I can't imagine what, I don't remember what life was like before kids. No, I can ex remember exactly what life is like before kids. Um, but sometimes when you're in the heat of just having and doing the days with the children, it can get, you can be like, well, what, what the heck was it like not to have kids? Um, so these, little, these are like little tiny reminders of, what's, of what that's all about. And then there's this crap, this crap right here. So you will take, we decided we were gonna have a natural birth, and it's a good thing Doug's not here yet, although I'm gonna make fun of him here in just a few minutes. We decided to have a natural childbirth, and so in order to do the natural childbirth, you get this whole natural childbirthing course. Um, and so what ends up happening is they teach you things like baby massage and how to like get your kid to relax when he's being colicky, which is just endless agonizing crying for no reason, um, or at least no reason you can understand. And I'll touch on that here in a, in a little bit. So, <laughs> they, uh, so you're sitting around and everybody's pregnant and you've got some like dads who are sort of like pulling their hair out. They're just really stressed about it and others who it's old hat. They know they're gonna survive. Um, and you're learning about how to massage your kid. You're learning all about like, what is pregnancy really about? What is the process of birth really about? Because how many of you have maybe older sisters who, who you've, you've kind of watched the pregnancy process? How many of you otherwise know, all you know about pregnancy comes from Hollywood? One guy's admitting this, two guys are admitting this, because most of us, it's sort of like, and I'll talk about this a little bit more, it's like, boom, the water breaks, they're screaming, there's a cut shot, it's your fault, you did this to me, you! <laughs> and she's pushing out the kid and the doctor's like, breathe! And so it's like this giant pandemonium, right? Get the forceps! And really, a lot of it is, it doesn't end up being, no, it's not like any of that at all, it's kind of funny that way. So, so you learn things like baby massage, and then you learn how, okay, so, so with that in mind, you can have a baby on your back. You know there are other ways you can have a kid, or as a woman can have a kid. Uh, squatting is actually a really effective means, because it's like, boom, open up the pelvis, push the kid out. Um, you can have, they actually have this partner-assisted way, it's like if I, was, if I had an envelope like the stage here, I could kind of hook underneath my wife's arms and kind of elevate her, so it pulls weight off the pelvis and it relaxes. And then you got, Crazy shit like the old man drying his balls in the Gold's Gym, Gold's Gym locker, like the captain. <laughs> Put your balls away, man. But this is a legitimate, like the lunge. Put foot on seat, chair, toes pointed back. Lean back towards the chair. Be careful where, with your balance. Look off to the side. <laughs> Push the kid out. Le they had a whole sheet of this stuff, uh, of ways you, other alternative ways you could have a kid things I had no idea existed, because I didn't grow up wanting to have kids. I didn't not want to have kids, but, you know, whereas my wife was happy to tell you, like, she was planning baby names and, and talking about all the things she would do and this and that and blah, 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 blah. So, old man drying his balls right there. Um, so, then there was the existential crisis. There's this idea of like before kid and after kid that I've, I've read about before, but I experienced firsthand. So prior to having my kid, I decided I was gonna be the white Usain Bolt because I had, I had the, this is the last bit of time in my life I was gonna have to try to, I don't know, do something with it, right? Like this idea that, that you have a kid and then all of a sudden you're fully in service of your kid. Um, and you have no hobbies or anything else after that. Uh, it's not entirely true but it is what ends up happening. The, this feeling of, I gotta do something before I am now a dad. So I'm pulling my hair out about this. It's like, all right, I'm gonna be Usain, the white Usain Bolt and I'm doing sprint training and it's a lot of fun. 
or um, I'm going to, what else did I want to be? I was going to be the best rock climber there ever was. Like, it's just, it's just you're grasping at straws. And this notion of trying to integrate an identity of soon to be a father with the identity of yourself as just a married guy or even a single guy. And I went through a little bit of that kind of getting married, but my wife and I had already owned a house. Like, we had a mortgage together, so it was an easier integration getting married. Uh, having a kid is pulling my damn hair out about this stuff. It was just like, oh, what is this going to be? And I, and I talked to all my clients who are fathers about this, and they all had kind of the, the hair pulling out experience as well, this notion of, um, holy crap, what is this going to look like? There's just no prior evidence and experience that you can have. You can be told, it's a bit like Russian literature, and I forget who I got this line from. You can, you can read it and understand it, but you cannot comprehend it unless you have grown up as a Russian. Like, and it's any culture, right? Anytime you learn a culture, you're learning from a secondhand experience. And it's almost like fatherhood and parenting is a, is a culture that you can look at and watch and go, I think I understand that. I, okay, okay, he looks really tired. And there's a screaming kid. And wow, that doesn't look like a lot of fun, right? But uh, then, you, then you get immersed in it. But you, you, you go through this phase in the middle where it's like the transition. You're going, I have no idea what, what this is all going to be about. And it scares me. You're going through this fog of war. Now the birth. So 38 weeks, there's my wife. There I am. Oh. Our kid was due t September 25th of 2013. And uh, I, uh, as I had noted, uh, we had decided we were going we to use the birthing center. And it was, the, by a country mile, the best medical care we've ever had, um, just from the environment to the, the time spent with us, to the concerns. Uh, even for me, as a father who's just there as like support role, um, we, uh, we, we were really, really happy with that. But when I, when I say birthing center, what does that make you think? Maybe something like a grass hut. <laughs> so, so, I could, so 21 Convention 2010, Doug's up here being Doug, hold on. So there I am in the ER, and some granola head decides they're going to have their baby in their living room, and it comes out with the umbilical cord around their neck, and they drop it in my lap. That's confirmation bias. Of course they're going to drop it in your lap. You're the emergency room physician. I didn't take my kid to the emergency room after I was done and say, hey, doc, look at my great-looking kid. <laughs> having said that, having said that, um, it's actually... Some people think kind of grass hut, and you're going to squat in the hole and push your kid out. Uh, at our birthing center, all the, all the midwives have master's degrees in nursing science and the extra training in that. And this was actually the room we, we, we had birth in, or gave birth in. And around the room, there are actually hooks on the walls because they can have, provide medical procedures based on how the birth is going up to some level. And then a mile down the road is the hospital. They, they set them up in proximity to those. You know, it's sort of like... It's an argument that often gets leveled, and it's totally spurious, which is, what happens if they can't do what, what they need to be done? They call someone who can do it. What happens if you need brain surgery, and you're at your family care physician? They call a brain surgeon. You know, it's a, it's a, it's a ridiculous argument that, uh, oh, well, you, you, you realize you're outside of your depth, and you call someone who knows. Uh, so we have this kind of wonderful room, and, and a week passes, September 25th is gone, it's all of a sudden October 2nd, and my wife is getting really, really infuriated, and she smacks me at 5 o'clock in the morning and goes, today's the day. I go, okay. Now, this is important, because I asked the midwives, like, okay, so what's, what's early labor and then active labor look like? And they just sort of go like, oh, oh, you'll know. Give me something. I like facts, I like figures, I like poses. So Sarah's getting these contractions, She's getting these contractions, and we're walking around the neighborhood, and nothing's happening. Nothing's happening. Finally, we go into the midwives that afternoon, and they sort of like lay on the table, and they go, oh, you're really a face, but you're not really dilated. So here's an important kind of point of distinction. At the cervix, what's happening is there's this mucosal plug that is, uh, when they talk about dilation and, and being a face, what's happening is your kid's head is kind of hitting the, this, the top of the cervix and slowly widening the space. This, this, uh, I'm going to talk all about the vagina later, guys. Don't you worry. You, you got, you, your kid hits the space, and it starts to widen the gap. And so you can be effaced and push, dropping down below this certain point. But 
the mucosal plug has to give up the ghost. It has to break, it'll either break slowly, or if you see it in the movies where it's like, bam, and it's a pickle jar, and, uh, and all of this fluid everywhere, and you're swimming in it, and it's just disgusting. It, didn't, it doesn't always happen like that. Sometimes it could just be a slow riff and a slow drip. Um, so my kid's just waiting to come out. He's trying to get out, and she's not really effaced, not, or she's very effaced and not really dilated. And so they're like, come back later, you're progressing. You're progressing, it's, it's fine. And the best part about it is our midwife, East German, five kids, she's great. Earlier in the pregnancy, she's telling us about, you're pregnant, that's fine, keep doing everything you'd rather be doing. She tells us a story about how this one girl comes into her trying to get a doctor's note so she can park closer at UT, like a sick note. And her response was, you are pregnant, you're not sick, you can walk. Like this idea that, that, that somehow the, the female anatomy and that uh, human beings on, on the balance haven't dealt with this, that haven't dealt with pregnancy and have to do stuff with it while pregnant is just absurd, very kind of Western society. If there's no, now, now having said that, we have friends who had twins and she was bedridden by like 20 weeks. So there are certain circumstances where that has to happen. But my wife didn't have that problem. So we were, she was still training and teaching and all that other fun stuff. So we, we get, so we get there and, and the nurse practitioner's like, eh, you're, you're fine, go, go home, you know, try and sleep a little bit, because this is gonna be coming. So, about 9.30, my wife starts doing this. <laughs> so if, if the midwife had told me, active labor looks like NBA players in the fourth quarter trying to catch their breath, <laughs> because you can't talk, you can't think, it's the most unimaginable pain, that would have been helpful. So there's a little tip. There's a little tip for you. First of all, active labor is not like, the, the most painful portion is not the pushing, according to every single one of my clients I've talked to about this. It's not the pushing, it's the contractions of your body trying to widen this space to, to get ready to shove this kid out. So there we are there, and we've got the active breathing and we show up. And here's why I don't have a, a mid-husband. Does it hurt? Can I get you a beer or something? Because we're, we don't know and we can't relate directly. I mean, we can know kind of in an academic sense and having been through it and so on and so forth. But uh, their care and their touch and having had kids and sort of going through the process. We get there at about, uh, let me see where I am. Yeah, okay. So we get there at about, about uh, nine o'clock in the evening and my, we've got that beautiful tub. My wife's trying to find a comfortable position. Again, she's like <laughs> on, the, on the bed. She eventually settles to sitting on the toilet with her head against the wall, because the porcelain's cold. She'll get up, she'd breathe through these contractions, sit back down, and lay there. So what's happening is the mucosal plug is slowly ripping, slowly ripping as the contractions are coming. I, meanwhile, are trying to sleep. And she's totally harsh in my vibe, trying to get a nap. To which she, still, she goes like, I cannot believe you tried to sleep. I go, what else was I going to do? You didn't want me around. She wasn't yelling at me or anything. She's like, you can't help, right? What, what I'm, I'm going to do, like help her contract that muscle. Uh, <laughs> you can't help. So I'm lying there on the bed trying to sleep because I know at some point I'm going to be, my, my marginal utility is rising with every minute. But in that moment in time, I was totally not useful. So I'm, I'm trying to sleep. So I'm effectively like Grand Haven father here. Uh, does it hurt? Okay, I couldn't, I'll, uh. So eventually, where things are progressing, things are progressing, things are progressing, about, uh, about 2.30 in the morning, they, they always say, when it feels like, they tell your wife, when it feels like you cannot go any further, that you've suffered so long, that's when, it, that's, that's when the good stuff's about to begin. So my wife's like, go, I need a shot, I need, I can't take it anymore. So I go and I get the nurse, and she comes in, and and she goes, well, we need to check, you know, well, we need to check. And, uh, and she comes in and um, proceeds to lay my wife back and, and go to check her. And, all, and then in that moment, bam, everything opens up. Finally, it gives up the ghost and she screams her out of the nurse, this baby's coming now. So nurse kind of wanders in. Nurse kind of wanders in. She goes, get the cart. It's coming now. So she runs off. So, so the movies, again, will have you believe that like crazy screaming. So what happened in my case is the most painful part again is, is, is the actual contractions. My wife said that the pushing is just like pressure. And your wife will probably crap herself when she's get, having a kid. Like, cause it's just all pressure and push everything out. 
My wife grabs my head. She proceeds to kind of park her mouth next to my ear and unleash a scream that I would roughly imagine is, you know, not like this, like I'm listening to my music and there's my, you know, there's my blood oximeter and I'm relaxing on the exercise ball, but something equivalent to screaming through a bullhorn in my ear with the predator cry, like <laughs> from space. It is the craziest sound I've ever heard in my life. It's about double the intensity I've ever heard my wife yell. And uh, she has no idea where it came from. It's like a wormhole opened up inside her. She reached out and grabbed one of those monsters from the Avengers and just channeled its voice. <laughs> Five minutes later, my son was born. So that was incredibly quick pushing. He didn't even have like, every one of my kids have alien heads. This is why they put a, a, a hat on them. Because you've got all those plates that are meant to shove through this tiny little space. It sort of moves them around, they look like cone head when it's all said and done. There's like a big portion up this way and that way. And then they have the alien eyes too. Um, this is on my chest, by the way. My wife doesn't have a big hairy chest. Uh, <laughs> um, and so, so, and he's just like, what's up, you know? And it's the weirdest thing. So your kid's born and it's a super high oxytocin environment. Um, I'm wearing stage makeup because HD doesn't nobody any favors. But, uh, but the touch with my kid is like the highest definition touch I've ever had um, in that moment. Now, it could just be total delirium, but this feeling of like, <laughs> almost like, hey, Jeans, pleased to meet you. Oh, right, yeah, these are, hey, you're part of me. That's cool. Um, and then even crazier than that, after all of that agony, my son's nursing for like 15 minutes right after he's right after pushed out, and uh, my wife turns to me and goes, Let's have another one. After all of that agony, after all of that pain and just craziness, the brain is just flipped and is like, okay, let's have, let, let's have another one. Now, in the meanwhile, while all this is happening, the midwife is down there kind of kneeling and like, my, so an episiotomy uh, happens when they need to, to create space between the, uh, to open up the vagina a little bit more. My wife didn't, they either do it uh, surgically or it tears. My wife had some tearing on the inner walls of her vagina, so the nurse is down there, just sewing her up, reaching in, sewing her up, and, uh, and we're just breastfeeding and having a grand old time. Uh, and then there's the afterbirth where the placenta gets pushed out, and they're sort of like, what do you want to do with that? We're like, give it to someone for stem cells, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> well, I, I, and to be honest, I don't remember what we actually did with it, because I'll get to that in a second. So like eight hours later, we went home. Like, we didn't have to stay. Sarah was able to get up and walk. We took Jack home. Um, and then begins kind of the interesting first year. So like I said, it really should be called fatherhood the first 21 months, not fatherhood the first 12 months. So now my marginal utility really begins. Uh, the closest thing I think you, we are going to get to time travel in our life is the first two months after having your first kid. Because I remember Oktoberfest, Kind of, because my son had like baby leader hosen. We took it to a friend's house. He was there during Oktoberfest. He was born on October 2nd. I remember a Halloween, maybe, uh, uh, the mashed potatoes I made for, for Thanksgiving and Christmas. But otherwise, nothing. I blinked and it was two months later. It's because you're tired. You're really, 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 really tired. And I think you're also tired because there's some literature on this about the morphology, the brain changes that go on when becoming a new father, some interesting things happen. You uh, develop certain components of the, of the audio processing portions of your brain to start to tie in with the, the cries of your kid. Because how many of you had a crying baby on your flight coming into uh, here? You did, you did, you did, you did, you did. I'll talk about that in a second. But, but all of a sudden, you start to get into wavelengths on your kid, or you're sort of like, oh, they're crying because they're hungry. They're crying because they're sleepy. They're crying because of this. It's very, very strange. But uh, yeah, I finished a master's degree in this, last, uh, in this period of time. I don't remember how. I did, it was great. Um, but that's the closest thing I think we're ever gonna come to time travel. Blink and it's two months later and you're going like, where did the time go? Um, that is something that you will experience with children. There's a great saying, which is the days and the months are long, but the years are short. My son's one now. And it feels like that. It feels like yesterday it was bored. But if I spent an entire day with him, it will have felt like, like I was on some sort of uh, three-day weekend bender, even though one day, we, one day has occurred. Like, like, you can't turn off being a dad. You're always on duty, but it's a weird thing. So, so having a child will cure you of narcissism, at least temporarily. 
because you, you realize like I always have to be on daddy duty and I have to be paying attention to this thing. Like you're doing other stuff, you get really good at multitasking. Like there I am like chopping vegetables and my son's trying to like turn on the stove and I'm like, buddy, back away, you know, go, go walk and I'm still chopping and I'm stirring this and I pick him up and I'll put him on the refrigerator and I'll be like, play with your magnets and I'm chopping. And then the mail comes and he comes crawling after it and he's tearing stuff down. And um, you're always on daddy duty, but all of a sudden you find this capacity to you realize that all of your interests are quite important, but you don't have to obsess about them to get them done in a good way. And in fact, having a little distance from all of your interests kind of lets you make better decisions about them. Have you ever been so obsessed with something that only when you got away from it did you realize that you made some bad decisions along the way? Being a parent by nature of fatigue and having to pay attention to someone else gives you that distance constantly. So you start doing this cost-benefit analysis in real time without the emotional component of, I really want this to work because I really want it to work which is kind of interesting, because then you start applying that elsewhere. If you, if you remove the domain dependence of, this is for my kid, uh, you start doing that elsewhere. And you're like, you know, I think I'm going to value sleep over seeing my friends again tonight. Or I think uh, you know, that ACL Fest is a great idea, but uh, I think I'd rather, just see, I'd rather see my friends. Like you start to become very compartmentalized in, in, in your decision making. But that first, first week, you're going to have what's called um, this beautiful La Brea Tar Pit type poop. This is in high definition. Again, high definition does nobody any favors. Um, so they tell you that this stuff is going to, to be a few days. And it's going to be a little bit. For my son, it was like a week. And you can't wipe that stuff off at all. Like your, your kid's going to crap, and you're going to open up the diaper, and it's going to be in all these crevices, and you've got the wipes, and you're sort of like, all right, all right. What the crap? And you're like rubbing your kid raw, and it's not coming off. Uh, meconium, there we go. And, uh, and you're rubbing it, rubbing, 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 and he's just like, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, you know, and like, what the hell's going on? Because he's been thrust into this world, right? It's a, it's a, it's a the existentialist crisis. You, you are thrust into being, and now you have to deal with it. And he's just like, well, dude, you're rubbing my butt. What are you, what's going on here? Um, and like I said, so kind of the, the nurses go, oh, yeah, it'll be a couple days. For me, it was a week. It was a week of this shit every two to three hours. And so you, you get used to it. Very quickly, poop stops being a big, stops being a big deal. So fun little, fun little bit. In, in the food and wine industry, women tend to be critics and tasters better than men. They possess better olfactory sensory organs. They, in fact, have a higher rate of what we call people who are super tasters, uh, which is like I don't know, 4K tasting. I'm not sure exactly what that looks like. But all of a sudden, you start gaining a sense of smell as a father for their butt that, that you just have no idea where it came from. Like, it's like Wolverine smelling saber tooth in the bushes off on the side. Like, <laughs> your diaper is dirty. And it's not, nobody else can smell it. Nobody else can smell it. But you've, you've evolved this, this wonderful olfactory uh, function from just being around your kid. And, uh, and it's, it's kind of incredible. And then poop stops, not only does poop stop being gross, but you stop, you're totally nonplussed by poop anymore. You're sort of like, all right, my kid's digesting food well, that's good. Or, or oh, I, there's some poop up my arm. Okay, I'll just wash that up. No big deal. Oh, it's on my shirt, that's fatherhood. You just don't, it just stops being a thing because you're constantly exposed to it. Um, it's just not a big deal. Uh, that doesn't mean you know, you're, you're, like, you're excited about it, but it just stops, it's just par for the course. Um, oh, actually, no, that's not true because if your kid's been constipated for seven days, you're really excited about shit. You are just so on board with poop at that point. Um, and then fatherhood. Fatherhood is so crazy. So you don't, we don't have a visceral experience of like having a kid, unless you're Arnold Schwarzenegger in that movie in the 80s. Um, and so, like, two of you got that joke. Um, and so, uh, so, so fatherhood is weird. We don't have this oxytocin-laced, crazy experience of shoving a kid out and connecting with it and having, us, having it biting on our nipples every day, thankfully. Uh, I'm very, very lucky in that way. And on top of that, early on, you're being, you're being ignored, not ignored, like, like intentionally, like stiff-armed by your wife, but you, the baby is taking precedent. Cool, I get that. My marginal utility increases with age. I understand that. So you're sort of like rationally, you go, all right, I love this thing. I clearly see its resemblance to me because I'm, you know, I, I look like I have alien eyes and, and wearing that funny hat. Uh, but, but fatherhood 
creeps up on you. Like you're taking care of the kid and you're going through the motions and you do care about it because you recognize this. But all of a sudden, fatherhood just kind of, kind of sidles up beside you. You're working with the kid one day and just kind of bumps you and goes like, hey, that kid there, you really want it to survive and thrive above your interests right now. Good talk. And it leaves. Like it, it's, like, it's like that little, like, good, good, good talk. And, and then all of a sudden, it's like, it's like, you're th it's like you, you go through this wormhole of, of beautiful relation with your kid, and it clicks. It doesn't happen immediately. In fact, some of my other, fathers talk, some of my other clients who are fathers talked about that. Like Early on, it's this really frustrating thing because they're not getting attention from their wife. They can't really comfort the kid because early on, you're not really a, a sense of comfort. You don't, have, you don't have the milk, and you don't have mom's smell. Uh, that's why they encourage like skin-to-skin -skin contact. You'd be laying there on your chest with your baby in, in its diaper, just on you, feeling, touching, communicating. And now my son likes me more than my wife, but that's just a phase. Uh, they'll go through it. They'll be like, I want mommy more than daddy. I want daddy more than mommy. So, so it, it does come back to eventually kind of pay dividends in that way. There, um, hmm. You're going to find that you start caring about things like schools. All of a sudden, your kid's two months old, and you're starting to worry about the neighborhood schools. You're starting to worry about preschool and daycare and all of this other crap and providing for your kids. There's a term, white flight, that is used when all of these, all of these previous people who are occupying the coffee shops and the bars in the city up and leave for suburbia because the schools are better. And this comes with some of that fatherhood element of like, shit, I gotta provide for this thing. And I either have to do it monetarily or I have to do it locationally. Um, you start caring about it in a really weird way. It's not something you chose to care about or even chose to take an active interest in. It just clicks, like that whole providing thing. Uh, and the thing is, is that the literature states it doesn't matter. I mean, it matters in the sense that, you know, if the school is riddled with bullets and, uh, and I'm, God, you know, or, or, or gun violence or um, just low performing academics, then, yeah, your kid is at, could be at a disadvantage. But there's a certain level in which continuing to reach for the stars does not provide any more of an advantage. And in the original Freakonomics book, they talked about how parenting, it's not about finding the best school. It's not about finding the best materials. It's not about being a perfect parent. It's about being someone who would so desperately care to try to find those things that leads to being a good father, or a good parent. It's not about doing it right. You're gonna do things mostly wrong by many measures, because you can only learn by doing. And then you get better at it, and then you get better at it, and then you get better at it, and you see that your kids are really, really resilient, especially boys, and I'll touch on that in a second. And they'll be okay, you know? You know, early on, it's new. You're kind of wondering what these little creatures are, and they are both, they're a little helpless, but as um, one, of my, one of my doctor clients said, you know, if they came out and their parts were on the other side of the room, they'd find their way back together early on, like that's, you know, the, the, that, that kids will be broken and then put back together really quick when they're really, really young. Um, but then you've got to start kind of, you start thinking about this stuff and it's never even entered your world before. And, and it's just a weird concern that shows up. Then the next thing you start thinking about is what's sex gonna be like with my wife after she's had a kid? <laughs> really, like, so, how many of you have seen Ace Ventura, When Nature Calls? Not all is lost on, the, on our generation, this is good. Uh, no matter how hung you think you are, you're not the size of a baby. And, uh, and so you're worried like, oh God, you know, what the hell's gonna happen here? And as it turns out, in our case, because remember that surgery I told you about? For the first nine to 10 weeks, like it was real touch and go because it hurt, like she was inflamed, she was taking care of a kid, she was exhausted. These things just weren't gonna happen and there I am, selfishly concerned, like, how's it gonna feel? Well, I can tell you that these soft tissues are meant to return to a relatively normal state. Things get back to normal. Now my wife cared enough about total health, she was leg pressing again, she was hip thrusting again, uh, there were some, some pelvic floor exercises, which are current, there, there's a total aside, there's an all the rage in uh, physical therapy about fixing pelvic floor dysfunction. Uh, which just Kegels aren't going to be enough. That, that there's, a, there's a crazy woman in Bali, uh, Kimanami, who she's all about like doing deadlifts with a Kegel ball attached to weight with her vagina. And I'm not even joking. I've only got one guy laughing. How's that not funny to you guys? Like the notion of like, all right, let's string up. What was that? 
They're not old enough. They're not old enough. So this notion of like, all right, we're going to hook up a loading pin, and then you're going to go down, and you're going to clench, and you're going to stand up with it. This is the type of stuff she's about for like vaginal muscle control. Um, so you don't have to go to that extreme. Your wife doesn't have to go to that extreme. Your girlfriend doesn't have to go to that extreme. But these things come back to normal, and you know we're, we're already thinking about having a second kid. So, but early on, again, your marginal utility is low. You're just playing like cleanup hitter. Like you're helping. You're a support role. Um, and then the crying. Oh my God, the crying. So, before I was a kid, or before I was a kid, <laughs> I was a baby. But before I was a father, I'd be on a plane and a kid would cry, and my spine would light up, like electricity shooting from my tailbone up to the back of my head, and I'd be like, oh my god, this kid, I swear to god, this kid. And then you have a kid, and two things happen. Number one, the only kid who can make that reaction happen is now your kid. Like, because if your kid lights up and cries, you, all of a sudden you're like, Vroom! what are you crying about? What's the deal? Because here's the thing. Your kid's not giving you a hard time. Your kid is having a hard time. Take that to heart. The only way it knows to communicate is loud and crying, because common, the, common the, the popular belief, your kids can't talk. Like, they can't formulate words and common rational structures and, and tell this stuff to you. They're still dumb. And the only way they can communicate what they want is with sound and fury. And the second thing is, all of a sudden on a plane, that, those other kids crying, I don't hear them. I'm reading and a kid's crying, oh, that's good, because it doesn't cause a visceral reaction. Another kind of superpower, but then you have a rational reaction of those poor parents, because they are pulling their hair out, trying to get these kids to calm down on the plane. Um, and then you're gonna find out that like, commands don't work on a, on a, on a newborn. I took my, took my son to see his great-grandmother in January, we have three dogs, and so you'll see where this is going here in a second. We're flying to, Riverside, or to Ontario Airport, Southern California from Austin. And in the last leg of the flight, my kid starts crying. <coughs> Pretty good, right? <coughs> and, and I'm like, shh, shh, shh. You know, we're trying to get him calmed down. He's been a trooper so far. And finally, I pick him up, and I hold him up in the seat, and I go, that's enough. And my wife just looks at me and starts laughing. Because number one, that's a, demand you give to a, a command you give to a dog, like, ah, that's enough. And second, again, the kid doesn't know any better. You're just you're grasping at straws. You're like, dog command, that's enough. Now you're going to find as kids get older, dog, training dogs and raising kids, kind of similar. Like, like as far as like, you don't do this, like there's a, you, if you set conditional expectations and they know how they're going to be disciplined for a certain amount of behavior, they'll tend to behave that way. Obviously, you don't feed them like dog treats. But, you know, for some, but God, God damn it, if it's not true that some of those kid some of those kid snacks may as well be dog food. Like, I mean, the same ingredients, just they replaced artificial bacon flavor with artificial cheddar flavor, you know? So, so you're, gonna, you're gonna get your screaming kid, you start to hear the differences in the screams. It's the weirdest thing, it's that next sense. All of a sudden you have this auditory processing, like, he's hungry, he's tired, he's got a wet diaper, he wants to go over there. My kid now grunts at things, he goes, ooh, 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 take me there, dad, ooh, take me there, dad. So we walk, and we go over there, and we go over there. Um, but it gets better, and, and, it, and it serves a function. It's not just because your kid wants to be a pain in your ass. And then the breastfeeding. So this is an image from a Time magazine about this attachment parenting. This kid's like four on his mom's boob there. Um, so my wife is still breastfeeding our son at a rate of like two or three feedings a day, uh, in addition to all sorts of solid food. And it's a really weird thing. A couple months ago, there was a big brouhaha about Olivia Wilde in a photo breastfeeding her kid. And you really don't think about it as sexual in any way. You just want to feed your damn kid. Like, we're sitting out there, Town Lake Trail, and my, wife's, my wife is, you know, she's not like sitting in front of the trail like, check out my cans, you know. She is, um, she's off to the side on a bench facing away from the trail and just trying to, just trying to feed our kid because he's hungry. Especially early on, he's not eating anything else, right? He's just hungry. It's not sexualized in any way. In fact, it's, kind of, it's comical, because you, all of a sudden you're reminded of the, of the fact that we are mammals. We can think about our own mortality and plan our futures and all that other stuff, but at the end of the day, we are animals, and we still have to abide by that, by that feeding our infants and, and having them hang on the udders and feed. Like, it is. It's, that's the way it is. Um, then he starts to get teeth, and she starts going, okay, your, your, your breastfeeding days are not long for this world, kiddo. 
So I want you guys to try and take that away, if nothing else. If you see a woman out breastfeeding, it's not because she's trying to be sexual or just doesn't care about anything. It's, she didn't care about you at all, in fact. She cares about feeding the kid, period, full stop. You don't even factor into the equation, and that's okay. It's not about you. As long as they're not just like making you accept it, like uh, who watches Portlandia? Anybody? Nobody watches Portlandia? Like the feminist bookstore women, like this overbearing, you have to accept what I do or you're a hater. No, it's not that either. It's not that either. It's live and let live. Kind of like, I'm just trying to feed my kid, you know, good, good luck with the rest of your day. Um, and so my son is already starting to display components of boy-like behavior. There is a nurture, but there is definitely a nature component as well. He's starting to get into things that he knows he shouldn't, and he's starting to give the smile, like, Jack, don't do that. And he'll be like, <laughs> you know? And he's just like, he knows he's doing something he's not supposed to. Now, all guys in the room here, you couldn't be told that you can't crack concrete with your head. You had to try and crack concrete with your head. And you go, oh, God, that hurts. OK, I'll remember that. Like, ooh, def and so there is some literature on this, this whole notion of like, oh, the differences between the sexes and children is just societally constrained, and that's not true. Um, it's not 100% either way, but for example, there's some literature that indicates that testosterone exposure in the womb alters play patterns of both boys and girls. So uh, women, or little girls who are exposed to more testosterone in the womb are more likely to pay, play with trucks than dolls when they're, when they're uh, toddlers, when they're children. And that boys also, uh, girls, their prefrontal cortex thickness, that whole like, you know, I should probably listen and do this and plan into my future a little bit more, uh, that, that starts to thicken and sort of reach its full thickness about 18 months earlier than boys. So on top of the fact that we are delayed in puberty, right, because women reach their full height and sort of full body at a much earlier age than we do, we also suffer the fact that our, our uh, executive functioning in our brain is about 18 months behind any girl you meet at about the same age. And this carries until full maturation in your 20s. Uh, so we are, this is great. Like, you want the cocksure 20-something who's certain he can change the world. Um, but it's also something that you, you, you see at a young age, and it's, it's actually nature. It's not like, oh, I just didn't care about my kid and let him play with, like, power tools, and that's why he's, you know, jumping out of airplanes without a, a parachute like Travis Pastrana or something like that. Uh, it's, it's an element of how we learn. We have better hand-eye coordination, but worse fine motor control. Great for doing and learning through activity. Poor for sitting in a class and working like this. And this is the great debate that originally all the school was for men. And then it became, how do, you, how do you make a school structure that supports women? And now we've done a really good job of that because there are more girls in college and more girls graduating high school. So now the opposite needs to be done. Like, boys are not mean or evil and they're not just all ADD. That we live in a high stimulation environment. We're in a high definition stimulation environment. So our dopamine button's always being clicked. Click, 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 click. You don't have ADD. Your norm is just an elevated amount of dopamine. So all of a sudden, sitting in class and paying attention is mind-numbingly boring. Oh my god, it's so, oh, so boring. So this, this is a camp. I want to say it's in North Carolina. Time Magazine did a, did a notion on, uh, on is called the Myth of Boys. It's about a six-year-old article, seven-year-old article, but it talks about a, a school in, in Harlem of all places where. It's an all-boys school, and they graduate 100% of their people. And the principal's talking like, you know, you got you to reach them in a way that, that gets them interested in something. And so you had these guys who were just dragging their asses. They couldn't, get, they couldn't find something they liked. And finally, they let them set up a recording studio. And once they had that thing that they were just so interested in, everything else came up, and they graduated. So they needed to do something actual hand-eye coordination and get up and move, and it wasn't just sitting there and studying uh, to integrate all that behavior. So you already start to see that at a young age. Um, my son doing things like, so he's in the tub, and he gets up, and he'll reach to the toilet, and he'll go, crack, 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 on the toilet seat. But the first time he did that, he about flipped out of the tub. I caught him, and he, <laughs> put him back in the tub. What does he do? Crack, crack, crack. <laughs> Think about anything else you've done in your life. Oh. <laughs> I'm bleeding. 
I'm going to do it again and learn from it. I uh, dislocated my, my middle, my ring finger here when I was 15 years old playing basketball. It dislocated, the ball came down like this and these two digits ended up on the third digit. It looked like a lightning bolt. So I go into the hospital and I'm walking around and this nurse is making fun of me like, what's going on here? And I pull off the ice pack and she's like, oh God. Um, and they proceeded to give me two shots of numbing agent, bend the thing backwards, pull it up over the joint and then jam it back together. They splinted me and said, don't play basketball. What did I do? I, split, I tied it to the pinky and I went and played basketball. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm a man. That's of course what I will do. And if you look at the, and if you look at the longitudinal statistics of men, here's the best part, and then I'll move on to the next slide, which is, uh, if you look at the death rates, uh, depending, or the, the amount of death split between men and women for certain diseases, trauma-related trauma -related death, the men are like way up here, and there's tiny, tiny little bit for women, and then you get to like dementia and, and uh, Alzheimer's and other, uh, or Alzheimer's and other dementia, and it's all women, and there's almost no men. I go, well, this is easy to explain. Because all, all of their husbands were the guys who said, hey, hold my beer, watch this, and killed themselves in this first graph, and then they just kept living and then could die of, die of old age dementia later. Uh, so you do have to watch out for that, but you don't want to stunt that, right? You want your kid to explore. You want your kid to, um, to be in a safe enough environment to know just how serious some of these things are, that he's dealing with are. There's a great TED talk recently about this, how like, they, they intentionally, this guy came up with a, uh, a camp for boys, and like, they're six, and they're like, using power tools and using saws and driving cars in people's laps. Because you have to learn the gravity of the situation. You can only do that by, by doing it. So you know, you're, you're supportive, and you keep a long leash on them. You don't want to be a helicopter parent. Um, but it's not a dichotomy. It's not either you're overbearing or you're totally absent and detached. There's a middle ground of knowing that we all wanted to explore. I mean, you can't help but explore. I was in the desert behind my house as a kid, coming back with cactus needles in me and a bad sunburn and you know, running away from animals and you know, all this kind of stuff. And, and he's going to want to do that too. And your kids are going to want to do that too. And you don't want to stifle that. Girls want to do it too. That's actually, I mean, if you watch them at the playground, girls play just as hard as boys, just as hard. And on top of that, when they're young, they're pretty damn strong too. So at my playground, there's this like, it's a track. You can hang on it and go like a zip line, like you're some sort of a secret agent or a, or a black ops guy. And the girls are doing it more than the boys. They grab on, they kick their legs and like, yeah, and go flying on the thing. And at some point, culturally, we go, oh, that's, that's not allowed. That's not ladylike. And you don't want to stifle either of those because that's going to set them up for a variety of things later in life. Um, so, so definitely don't want to stifle that. And then you end up with this. So this was a few weeks ago. There's my wife. That's me, uh, of course. And my son. You get through the first year, and you're sort of like, OK, I think I've got a handle on this. But every year is different because now, now he's a toddler. He's almost walking. And that gets him into all sorts of other trouble. He's opening up cabinets. He's throwing things out. He is, uh, his teeth are coming in. So, he's, so he has two teeth. And your kid is just going to cry and scream when these teeth come in. Now, if you think about this, like if you imagine razor blades pushing uh, through your, your gums, because you don't remember it, you're one, that would pretty fucking hurt. And that's what your kid's crying about. Again, he's not, ha he's not giving you a hard time. He's having a hard time. Um, and it's just wonderful. It's this very bizarre thing. All of a sudden, I can remember what it was like before I had a kid, but I wouldn't want to go back to that. That's me personally. I'm not making a judgment on anybody else. Everybody's got their own life to live. Uh, but I, you know, I, wanted, I did want to have a kid, but I didn't obsess about what it would be like, like my wife did. Um, or obsessed by comparison. She probably thought it was just a normal amount of thinking about having a kid. So you'll have to do these photos, and that'll be great, because as I said earlier, the days are, sh are long, but the years are short. Next thing you know, your kid will be like five. They'll be like, holy crap, where was this little guy? It was yesterday. He was just born, right? And it's true. It's so cliche, but it's true. And, uh, and so, you know, then the next adventure begins. I could come back next year and be like fatherhood the first 24 months, and it would be a whole different set of lessons. And you have to understand that your thoughts can't be static in what you're attempting to do and parent and, and being caring and willing to change and be fluid. Uh, is the best advice I can give you. I hope some of that stuff was helpful. Some of the stuff I've talked about was helpful as far as thinking about it a little bit more, sort of high definition poop smell, uh, what, what active birth actually looks like, like breathing, they can't talk to you, they don't want to talk to you because it's agonizing pain. Um, my experience, uh, and, and Steve can corroborate some of the experience we had with uh, having natural childbirth, and if you don't want to do that, you want to plan a C-section, that's cool too, you know. 
uh, but is to, to kind of be informative, to tell you all about it. And do uh, you have any questions? Anybody got any questions for Skylar Tanner? As, as gross as you want, guys, I'll ask. I'll answer <laughs> specifics. Uh, Skylar, do you believe it's possible to focus too much on trying to be a good father? And yeah. Yeah, uh, now there's a period of time where you need to, it's a, it's not an elimination, right? If you think about it like a pie, think about it like a pie chart. What you don't want is a spuriously stacked set of blocks going up to the ceiling with, with being a father being the only supportive thing underneath and the moment that thing goes, it all collapses. That's way out of balance. You wanna think about it like a pie chart in which you're varying the amount of focus for periods of time. I did say like that being a father will cure you of narcissism pretty quick, but it's short term, right? At some point your kids are gonna become self-sufficient enough to where you don't have to pay as much micro attention. You're sort of, you go, you go from micromanaging to macro managing. And then, you know, then you have your own lives. I mean, uh, you, I still have my own life. Like I'm here right now and I don't have my wife or my kid here, right? So uh, because there's that initial period of just really high, high touch, high, high, high. And then you start to slowly back away. And that's something culturally, this is kind of the, the, the explanation of, uh, Anthony will like this. What is the 21 convention? Well, early on, it was the under 21 convention. It was how do you approach and pick up women? And now it's become, we live in a society that lets you, it's a melting pot, it lets you have any cultural, no, microcultural norm you want. Totally supportive. The problem with that is we have no cultural norm to shepherd us into adulthood, to shepherd us into manhood, unless you come from a, a traditional background. If you're, if you're Jewish, or maybe you have some other, your first generation and they're still hanging on to some of those cultural components. Um, we don't have that. Simultaneously, those cultural components serve not only to prepare the child for adulthood, but also to prepare the adult for the child leaving. The bar mitzvah is not just, hey, you're 13, you're an adult. It's, your kid is leaving soon, get ready. It serves both purposes. Uh, so that I tell my clients ago, the 21 convention is now, what does it take to be a full, complete, good man in America, in the world? And part of that is sometimes putting others, others' needs before your own, but understanding in this case that those are your genes. You are a rented vehicle. You're now passing those things on. You want those things to thrive. That's, if, if I'm gonna be very biological, the real meaning of life is that. Get your genes on the next generation. Anything else is romantic. Get your genes on the next generation. Um, so there's a self-interest in that, but on its face, it doesn't look like a self-interest. And eventually, it, it's the, the pie reorients itself, and you're going back to your hobbies at a fuller clip. So yes, you can have too much of a focus on your children, but there are periods of time where it's gonna look like that, but in the grand scheme of things, it was the exact right amount of attention for the needs of the time. That's the being fluid part I talked about. My second question, um, some people believe in uh, when babies, like really young babies, they cry, they, they let them cry it out, and they, they ignore them until they stop. What do you think about that? So, so there's, a, there's a couple components with that typically the cry it out sleep method is the idea that you just let your kid just wail in the crib is what some people take it to, but if you actually read the sort of original proponent of kind of cry it out, you can be present. The idea is that you would give, give the kid comfort and kind of give them what they want if you pick them up and then they'll start to become attached to only falling asleep on you or in your bed because you know, my, my kid slept in my bed. My kid still ends up sleeping in my bed. He'll sleep six or seven hours. I'll get up in the middle of the night, I'll go grab him, I'll come back and I'll fall right back asleep. And he falls back asleep too, so that's great. But he's sleeping more and more of the night without us. But early on he'd be crying and you'd go in there like shh, 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 shh. You're supportive, you're not ignoring him, but he's going to cry until he stops crying in a supported way. Some people take it like, we're going to the store, adios bro, you know? <laughs> but it's not that, that's not what it is. It, it's just, you don't pick the kid up, you don't, you don't kind of coddle them when they're crying, you, but you're supporting them. Thanks for the talk, Skylar. Um, I wanted to ask you uh, more about how your relationship has changed with your wife mm -hmm. and how that has affected your happiness in your relationship with her. That's great, because that's actually something I forgot to, to touch on and I wanted to. Um, and that wasn't a planted question either. So <laughs> you, the, the, you feel extra vigor? Thanks, snake oil salesman. But um, so first of all, watching my, my wife give birth to my son, man, tough. Like my wife is so hardcore. And uh, it's a, you, you gain a new appreciation for not only the amount that she can suffer, but just how strong women are. 
uh, that there's this notion of uh, the, the fairer sex or the weaker sex, not at all. My wife is incredibly tough, and part of being in a marriage means you've agreed to a process. And so this is a kind of a time in the process where uh, we're both having to move through the same space, and we have, we've had to remind ourselves a number of times it's not, I can very easily get focused on like the finances and on doing this and on doing that and on supporting the family, and we have to remind each other kind of on a, on a regular basis, we are a partnership in this. And it's easy to think about I have to take care of them when really it's we are working together to maintain this household with our mutual strengths. Um, what, I've, what I've kind of come away with more than anything, like, like I'm attracted to her more than I've ever been before. Um, I am also sure of what of her capabilities even more than before. And in fact, I, she kind of is too. She's like, I've gone through that. Nothing is too hard. Nothing is too hard. Um, and I kind of feel like uh, it's a bit like that high intensity touch I talked about with my kid. It feels like my relationship with my wife is, is strong, but that might not be the same for everybody else. In my case, I feel like I'm in an be even better place now. I feel like we could suffer a whole lot in a marriage and go through really, really much harder times as a result of this experience, because this hasn't been a hard time between us, but it's definitely a stressful and you're not paying attention to each other nearly as much. So your ability to come together and really focus on each other, you can, you can drop the other stuff real quick. It's an interesting kind of, uh, you don't. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And sometimes, you know, you'll go a couple days and you sort of like forget to check in with one another. You're just sort of almost a roommate and then you go like, hey. And, and, and you get back to, and it's beautiful. Um, so yeah, I mean, I'm gonna, she and I always, I, I've gotta live longer than she does, but she wants to live longer than I do. So, you know, it's, I, I don't wanna be married to anybody else. Here's, oh, more dating advice from an 83 year old client of mine. He said, he's been married 60 some odd years, he goes, you feel the same after an orgasm whether you're with Marilyn Monroe, right, he's 80 something years old, whether you're with Marilyn Monroe or some other girl, so why switch horses midstream? <laughs> you are just not gonna laugh, are you? <laughs> So, so yeah, there you go. Awesome, Skylar Tanner, guys, amazing speech. Thank you so Thank much. You. Yeah.